Radio Split Ranch. Hello and welcome once again to Radio Split Ranch, a monthly visit with the Capital Region's great broadcasters of the past and sometimes present. I'm Warren Garling when I'm not on the radio. And that's why in the following conversation, you're going to hear my guest call me by my air name, Chris Warren, at least once, since we met professionally first and then became friends. This guest also interviewed me on TV a few years back based on a passage from my first memoir, I'll Have to Ask My Mom. Here comes the plug. Available for a new low price through Amazon.com, and there's also an audio version on Audible.com. You may recognize this guy's voice from his days doing radio news and maybe even put a face to the voice if you remember him from his stints in two local TV newsrooms. Of all the guests I've had in almost three years at the Radio Split Ranch, this guy should get an award for best name dropping. I know you're going to enjoy getting to know John Craig. Now, John, you know there's no video here today. It's it's just oh, audio. Where, just no, audio. What? No so, camera. So, so all those tapes you just brought. That yeah, you, yeah. I, I can't. I can't put oh, these on, on the on the geez. podcast. Sorry. Well, all right, pack them up. <laughs> pack them up. <laughs> but uh, I want to tell you, I enjoyed the the you know, little bit that we worked together while we were both in the same building at, at WGY years ago. I, I really got a kick out of how serious you can be on the microphone doing news. And then how much fun you could be off the microphone and, and still keep it clean, which was pretty cool. You know, I, I thought that was pretty neat. Well, thank you. Th- <laughs> thanks for having me. Thank you for having me in your, um, in, in this palatial studio. <laughs> yeah, right. The radio uh, split ranch. That's right. I love the split ranch, but, uh, no, it's, uh, you know, radio, actually radio is one of my first loves. I mean, uh, when I was in high school, uh, I went to, we had a 10 watt radio station. Did you? In the, and Which was rare. Obviously yeah. high schools didn't have, right. and yeah, we had a 10 watt radio station and I always thought the first thing I ever wanted to do was do radio play by play. Wow. And, uh, you know, I always thought telling stories either visually with, with television or audio, or yeah. if you have that person that you're interviewing, telling their story and you hear, yes, you can manipulate all that stuff. And of course, we see it time and time again these days. But you try not to have that happen, right? I'd rather have the person tell the story in first person, sure. Uh, because you know, even print sometimes you can read it differently. That's true. You know, a printed word, an email, even you, you read you read differently than if it was spoken to you. Yeah. So, uh, but radio was something that was always. I, I mean, I, I used to, I was one of the kids that snuck a radio into when I was in elementary school to listen to the World <laughs> Series. The World Series, yep. I yep. bought one of those flat speakers that you could plug into your transistor and stick under your pillow, wow. so you could listen to some of the radio yeah. play by play way back when. Sure, sure. Um, oh, great stuff. So, yeah, you mentioned high school. Where yeah. did where did you uh, grow up? Where did you start? Grew up in North Jersey, okay. and uh, I grew up in a town called Wyckoff, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, which about 20 minutes outside the city. Okay. My dad worked in the city and uh, we were in the suburbs. Um, well, then you listened to the number one radio market in the country. I sure did. Up. And yeah. I, long before anybody cared or wanted to listen to I Miss the Morning, I was, I, I would listen to him <laughs> while everybody else was listening to WPLJ and WNEW FM and all sure. those. Uh, I'd eventually come around to that. But uh, uh, I Miss was. I, I aspired to maybe, you know, hey, I wanted to do updates on his show someday. And this is, of course, long before any of his controversy. He was just, he was the pillar in my mind. If you, sure. you picked one or the other, it was Imus yeah. or Stern, I went with Imus. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I grew up with the number one, knowing full well that if I wanted to be in this business, I couldn't go to the number one market. I'd mm-hmm. have to go to a small market or yep. a medium-sized market sure. and work yourself work your way up. Yep. It's different these days. You can stay Man. where you are and... You know, do my, a podcast or do whatever you want. My first job out of uh, college was up in Saratoga Springs, WKAJ. Right. And for a while, I did morning news, and the first newscast wasn't until 7. So right around 6 o'clock, I'm coming out of the police headquarters where I've looked at the overnight reports and all that stuff, trying mm-hmm. to see if anything happened that sure. I could write up for news. And I would listen to WNBC That's and listen right. to Imus. That's right. And so I'd listen to him before I'd you know hit the station and oh, sure. uh, you know and had to go in and do my own thing. Yeah. The fifty thousand clear channel of WNBC. Yeah. I, yeah. I, when I was, uh, I was an intern in college. I went to so I graduated from high school in North Jersey, okay. and I went to James Madison University in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. Ah. And part of that of getting the communication broadcasting degree 
we had to have internships. And um, I had an internship at, at NBC, the building, 30 Rock. Wow. Uh, two days a week. Um, and I, a couple, you know, they'd allow you to go around and or take the tour and so on. And there's, you know, there's the icons of broadcasting oh, right yeah, there. And sure. I, I always, I actually wound up meeting Imus a long time later when I worked at CNBC. He was a guest on one of the shows that I was working on. Wow. And I was so nervous to meet him. Sure. Uh, I had read his book and uh, <laughs> several books and uh, went in and you're not supposed, you you work for those places. You're not supposed to ask for autographs and so on. Sure. Uh, this is long before any cell phones, so you can't take pictures. But I, I have a signed book of uh, God's Other Son. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, uh, the <laughs> uh, his uh, the the um, what was the, bro- the, the the oh gosh, now it's blanking. I can't remember the other uh, one. Billy Saul Hargis. Oh yes, yes, yes. Great yes. Billy Saul Hargis. Yeah. His uh, <laughs> the the. If anybody remembers that, then you're way too old to be listening. So, so. what uh, what years are we talking about then? When did you? Uh, when were you in college? Gra- uh, I graduated high school eighty seven, college eighty seven to ninety one. Okay. Um, and I actually thought I would go to uh, JMU for a couple years and maybe transfer and see where it led me. Uh, they had a public radio station um, that I wound up doing something for WMRA because um, all most most higher education had a public radio station. Not a lot of them had a real, you know, their own student run radio station. But, uh, so I went there and I would do my, uh, radio mentor at the time he was running the place and he saw that I had an interest. Mm-hmm. So he made me get up at, uh, five thirty in the morning <laughs> to come in and do a five minute sports update hmm. at five minutes to eight but he made me come in that early and write and rewrite the copy sure. and rewrite it again. Yeah. It didn't do me very much good <laughs> when I got to my eight o'clock psych class, <laughs> yeah, psych right. 101, and fell asleep because they put you in one of those hundred ro- hundred seat rooms, <laughs> let, drop the lights, yeah. and then pff, you're yeah, out. Exactly. Well, uh, at least you went to psych class. I, I, I skipped that and went to the radio station, oh, the go. college radio station. Well, yeah. No, so I went, and uh, I think I wound up with a three-hour D in there, but that was... <laughs> exactly. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but he taught me a lot about uh, writing copy, rewriting copy. I had to, as part of it, and I knew nothing about that area, Harrisonburg, Virginia, but I would have to call the high school coaches in football season and do a high school football ranking and those kinds of things. Wow. All those things... Uh, just as sort of you know repetition, it's like if you're trying out for a sports team, you have to run the drills. This is this is what he made me do. Good, um, you know. And uh, one time, I I think I you talk about my humor and so on. I was doing <laughs> sports and I started laughing. I was doing the I was doing the sports and there was another woman doing the news. And uh, the rookie of the year for the for NASCAR at the time was Dick Trickle. Oh and, boy, uh, yeah. <laughs> that one I did not pre-read that and that name, yeah. <laughs> Next thing you know, the two of us are just falling off the chair. <laughs> and, we, and it was over because this was a very staid, you know, mm-hmm. public station that the uh-huh. older people are listening to and blah, blah. And we get off the air and he lit us up uh, one side and down oh, the other sure, sure, because okay. of Dick Trickle. Oh, God. Oh, <laughs> oh God. But you know what? Uh, there, there was a time in radio, especially when I first got into it, where you could have some fun like that and and be completely silly and and try to make the other guy break up while he's reading the newscast and all that yeah, yeah, stuff. Yeah. And for some reason, we got away with it. I don't know where the bosses were in the when this was happening. That's right. But we right. did. We seem to get away with it in in you know nine times out of ten. Some then, were listening, some were not. Yeah, that apparently. there you go. Yeah, and then of course the tenth time was you know when you really thought, well, I'm I'm out of this job. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. I th- and uh, the great thing about um, my friend uh, Ken, he's been my friend. Uh, he 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 re- he was a self described mentor, but he is a really a mentor for the for my this business. Uh, he went on to um, uh, move to Kansas and so on, but we kind of we still keep in touch. And nice. He still refers him to himself that, and I refer to him as as that too because he you know he really uh, put put it in me that uh, you know mm. if you're going to do this, you got to do it right. Yeah. No, that's good. So uh, what happens um, uh, from there? Well, so I got internships at uh, CNBC during the time when nobody knew what CNBC was. Uh, and it was actually called the Consumer News and Business Channel. That's what the, the letters stood ah. for at the time. Mm. Uh, and they were going up against uh, FNN, 
Mm-hmm. And so, but I wanted, uh, so I, I wanted to do some kind of television writing. I had always been, a, I had been a writer first. I had done, when I was in high school, I covered our, our uh, sports teams, whether it be basketball, football, fencing, mm-hmm. uh, soccer, you name it. So I wanted to be, I figured if you could be a writer first, then you could do anything you wanted. Sure, so that was for the school newspaper? For the, yeah, well, actually, and it was for the local weekly. Too. Oh, there you go. It's kind of like a penny saver type oh, of thing. Oh, that's cool, yeah. Yeah, so first I did that, I did it for that, but I, yeah, I was also the sports editor and the editor of the, of the school paper. Cool. Um, so I, I was always a writer first, and then I did uh, did radio, and then the television got me to uh, the internships at CNBC, and I worked at the assignment desk, um, and they would send me out with photographers uh, to pretty much be a field producer. Okay. And you would gather the news and so on. One time, I I was an intern for uh, Steals and Deals, which was a show self-explanatory. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would go out, and one time I interviewed the Madagascar hissing cockroach. <laughs> And I didn't even know what that was, but I'm holding the microphone and you kind of poke it with a pencil because, and it literally would hiss Ugh. and you'd need to get the gnat sound of yeah, that, yeah. you know, and then you'd take, you learn all the TV tricks where then you take the mic out and then take another shot of the, of the cockroach and then they put the audio in and all, all that just because you can't do it any other way, really. Yeah. Um, and one time I was, uh, they sent me up actually to Watkins Glen. I wore a tie. I was all, you know, I'm a high school, I'm a college kid, but um, I go up to the uh, races <laughs> because somebody had heard that they had reconditioned Pintos. So they took the, the Pinto, of course. Sure. From, from, I'm sure your listeners will know, but <laughs> yeah. if they don't know, used to blow up when yes. they got rear ended because <laughs> yeah. that's where they put the gas can, a gas tank. Uh, well, they obviously took all those out. They put in a standard racing fuel cell, and it became this, it's like a stock car. Wow. Kind of like going out to, to New, Le- New Lebanon or somewhere. Sure. And so they sent us up to Watkins Glen on a Saturday morning, and I went with a photographer, and I did all these interviews and so on, uh, and cut my own my own demo reel Nate. from some of that. Nate. And that got me, you know, my college credit and, and helped to earn uh, or was put on one of my tape, my early tapes, because it was shot better than anything we shot in college, uh, <laughs> to try and get a job uh, after college. There you go. But it uh, it became so. I, I did, one time I was on the city streets of New York. I don't remember what the topic was, but the next thing I know, some guy comes up to me. And he he thought I was really on television, and he's dropping trow to show me. <laughs> he's like, he just look at this. Put this on the news. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. What's happening? And the photographer's oh, laughing God. his head off. And Only so, in New York City. That's right. Yep. And yep. all these, and I'm just this wet behind the ear kid from the suburbs of New Jersey going, what have I gotten myself into? Exactly. Exactly. So so CNBC. The, the, now, this was pretty yeah. early days then, obviously. It really was. Yeah. yeah. We, they were based in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Okay. Uh, and matter of fact, I had, inter- I had applied for internships at CNBC and WFAN at the same time. Ah. Which ironically turned out to be where Imus was. Yeah, he was exactly. the morning guy. Yeah. And uh, I went and interviewed at C- uh, at both places. And the difference was, and I really wanted to do sports. I really thought that someday I was going to be Brent Musburger wow. or Bob Costas. Good for you. Um, or, you know, Jim Nance, whatever, <laughs> uh, someday. And I really, that's what I wanted to do. And I so I go in, I do the interview, and they offered, and I... Maybe I should have done it. I don't know. Hindsight's great. But uh, WFAN wanted you four days a week, including one overnight shift, Ooh. To and you would produce for whoever the, the talent was. Sure. And I didn't know anything about producing, but I was, I'm was. i sure you'd learn quickly. Learn. Yeah, you learn by doing. Uh, but I had to cross two bridges, I think, to get there at the oh, time. Oh, gosh. Uh, pay for your own parking. <laughs> yeah. Bring your own food. Uh, they weren't going to do any of that. You were going to get the college credit, but they weren't going to pay you a dime. They weren't even sure. going to pay you gas money. Oh, boy. And I quickly did the math. <laughs> and and then CNBC was in Fort Lee, which is about 20 minutes right before the bridge. There you go. And uh, I was started off with, I think it was, they, they let me come, actually, they let me come four days a week. Okay. Um and uh, that had built off of my two days a week when I used to ride the bus into to 30 Rock. And I thought, I always heard that if you get in at NBC, you're mm. going to have, mm. that That could be something. Yeah. And so I sort of weighed the pros and cons back and forth. And I'm going, I don't know about this. 
Uh, I'd really kind of like the the WFAN thing because you know I'm yeah, I, more I really sports like, oriented. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I thought, well, if I can do this other, maybe I could. So in, in the end, I chose CNBC, and um, within a couple of years, it went from. Uh, in, I did back-to-back internships my junior and senior year going into that. Nice. And that led eventually to coming back. I graduated in 91. I kind of farted around that summer um, because I thought, oh, this is going to be good. I'm sure. going to have job offers left and right. This will be great. <laughs> and it didn't. And uh, sometime in the spring of 92, there was an opening uh, to work primetime. So I worked for the Dick Cavett Show. Did you really? Yes. Wow. I worked for Dick Cavett, one of the icons of this business. Absolutely. He is the only person I ever wrote to a network about. Is that right? Because ABC had him on mornings for a while yep. back in the mid-60s, sure. late 60s, and they took him off. And he wasn't on TV for a while, then right. he got the late night thing. And I was so ticked off they took him off. Uh, it must have been during the summer when I'm watching. I mean, I'm still in school. I'm yeah. in high school at the time. And it's the only time I wrote a letter of complaint to a to a network, and it was because they took Dick Cavett off the air. Well, he, yeah. he is one of the smartest, oh, funniest, yeah. Yeah. just all around. I mean, he wrote for Carson. He wrote for, sure. he wrote for Jack Parr, and he wrote yep. for Carson briefly before he went off, and they offered him his own exactly. prime time sh- or uh, late sure. night show. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he couldn't have been nicer. He, he was terrific. so terrific. Wow. Um, and he would come in once a week and tape two shows. And during the rest of the week, I would work on helping to either write some um, research for him, book the guests to come in. Um, I told Christopher Reeve that he was getting picked up in a black limo and it was a white limo. Oh, and, no. <laughs> yeah, and he was not happy with me when he shows up, when he showed up in a white limo and um, I turned ashen white and he gets out of it and he's like, who booked this car? I'm like, sorry, Mr. Reeve. Uh, but I got to meet a lot of really great people. I met Steve Allen. Oh, uh, wow, yeah. me too. I, I sat and interviewed him for a few Is minutes. that right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Over, over lunch one time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He he, of, he loves himself from Steve the, Allen, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One, well... He, He's very nice, though. Very, very nice. nice guy. Yeah. But he also was very exacting. Yes. And yes. so occasionally I'd ask him a question, and he'd said, "Well, your question assumes such and such and such." Right. And I go, "Oh God, this is right. going to be interesting." And right. so he did that to me a couple of times. I think I still have the interview somewhere. I read um, "Bigger Than a Bread Box" a number of years ago, yeah. and you repeated a lot of the routines that you did. Uh, completely ad-libbing um, you know, commercials and such, or at least getting away from the, the 30 seconds that was written for you. Mm-hmm. Is this something that's always come natural to you? Yes. I, I'm still a little surprised that the world pays me to do what I always did anyway, you know, in school and in the home and among my friends. I think uh, among those professional comedians who are true natural comedians, as distinguished from somebody with 400 great jokes in a tux, uh, you do find, if you look into their life histories, that they their funniness emerged in their childhood. Uh, they didn't suddenly get to be 33 and say, I think I'll become a comedian. They found out usually when they were about 12 that they were funny. He was a hero of mine uh, from the moment I read his book, Bigger Than a Bread Box, which yeah. was all about his early radio days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, he, uh, and, and I went down the list. I mean, and occasionally I would get to pitch a story or a, 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 a guest idea. Like one time I said, well, you know, the senior PGA is coming. We could get Lee Trevino and we booked mm. Lee Trevino. Mm. I said we could try Tom, uh, Tommy Lasorda. And we all went out to Shea Stadium at the time. And I helped to uh, field produce that piece with wow. Tommy Lasorda. Wow. Uh, Dick went on the road a couple of times to go to St. Uh, went to St. Louis. And they, they were like, well, who can we get in St. Louis? Mm. I said, well, there's this guy's. He's a broadcaster. People might know him as Dan Deardorff. Oh, God. Um, but I don't know if the average person is going to know who he is, but he, he does do, mm-hmm. uh, I think at the time he was doing Monday Night Football or he was yeah. doing weekends, and they booked him. So How about that? Uh, so now, which, to, which incarnation of the uh, Dick Cavett show was this? This was his primetime show, a probably 90... Early 90s, so 92, okay. 93, 94, that, that All right. area. Okay, now um, on uh, the PBS show or uh, no, this was uh, after syndicated? The, or? This was syndicated. Okay. Well, it was on CNBC. Oh, okay. CNBC during the day I got you. was, sorry, yeah, I should have. That's okay. CNBC during the day was financial news. Yeah. And then uh, they needed prime time. They needed some things to fill those hours. Wow. And uh, I, they came up with a number of ideas Dick being one of them because they thought, well, that demographic certainly translates. Yes. People that would watch financial news sure. would know who he is and he, the guests he would have. Yeah. So we would have a, a Dick Cavett show. They had a couple of talk shows. 
Uh, they did an issue oriented show, like a Washington kind of thing. Um, but so the Dick Cavett show was one of them. And then we had a show called Posner and Donahue, Vladimir Posner and Phil Donahue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Phil, obviously an icon. Sure. And Vladimir was sort of the Phil version in Russia. Yeah. And he came on Phil's regular talk show a couple of times and they struck it up. A, a nice friendship and they created this the public of current affairs show and i got to help screen calls for wow, that wow wow uh and then that also led to geraldo rivera and he after his daytime show which uh of course led to the chair and the breaking of the nose and the whole thing mm-hmm. he and he sort of, and, and the uh al capone's vault yes which i remember watching with my father and my uncle in Florida, the night it aired. I'll be darned. Uh, and we watched, we were riveted, watched yeah. the whole thing. Oh, sure. I, I remember watching it, yeah. So all of that happens, and, you know, I'm, I was a kid, but I'm thinking, next thing I know, um, he wanted to reinvent himself reinvent himself with a current uh, public affairs type show. Wow. Sort of like a like a Larry King type of show. Gotcha. Uh, but he wanted to do with issues, and he comes to CNBC. So they had all this primetime lineup nice. that would air, you know, Dick was about a half hour show. I think it would air at 8, 8 to 8.30. And then they had uh, another Washington type show from 8.30 to 9. And then they do 9 to 10. They eventually would hire Tom Snyder and some others. Uh, so they had this whole, it was CNBC primetime. I still have a sweatshirt. Uh, I thought, boy, I was really going to make it sure. as in, yeah. in, at the network level. And I'd never have to go to a small market. There but, you go. Um you know, I did it for a while, and and Geraldo was nice. He was terrific. Uh, not at all. You, you think the parody of himself that that, that maybe uh, mm, yeah. But he had certainly built his journalism chops on Willowbrook. Well, and that's some other what I was things. just going to say. I mean, he was a serious newsman in New yes. York City for yes. a long time. Sure Absolutely, and he sure cut was. his teeth, you know, in, in the right place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, I mean, for me, as a little as a young kid in my early twenties, to work for Dick Cavett. Phil Donahue, Vladimir wow. Posner, oh. and Geraldo Rivera. I thought, okay, I'm getting somewhere. You're on your way. I well, I'd hope so. <laughs> so what happened? Uh, what happened? Let's see. I wanted to be on air, so I really thought, okay, I could stay here and be a producer f- and and build a nice career. But I wanted to be on air. I wanted to see what that would do. I wanted to see if I if I could do it. And I started sending out tapes and applying. And about this time, yeah, it was around President's Weekend, long weekend. I took a few days uh, in 1994 and went down because I had gone to school in Virginia. And I kept in touch with my friends. uh, And I went and crashed on their couch. And I went to three stations in Richmond. Hmm. And uh, I went even to this back to the station in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And I thought, well, I've got to start a small market because one of the things I did too, I also, I volunteered on all these CNBC shows and Tom Snyder one night, who was based in LA, had Dan Rather on, mm-hmm. but Dan Rather's in New York. So I stayed to kind of be his escort up to the studio. And, all right. And I'm like, Mr. Rather, can I talk to you for a minute? <laughs> uh, and I said, hey, I really kind of want to do the news or, or yeah. sports or something. He says, we well, have to go to a small market. Yeah. Because at the yeah. time, in the early 90s, you still had to do that. You do. Yeah. You really did. I mean, he did it. Everybody did. I mean, sure. I, re- I read his books, uh, all those things. So now I have to tell you again yeah. that he's one of my heroes. There you go. Dan Rather. I mean, the so camera far, never blinks. You're, you're naming all these heroes that I had <laughs> o- over the years, but absolutely. I mean, and, and to this day, he's my hero. I subscribe to his. Uh, podcast or his yeah. um, uh, you know email that he does uh, all, all the time steady yeah. and uh, because he's just got just such a you know I mean, he he's always been on target as far as I'm concerned yeah, yeah. you know he's I he's mean one of the great the clips right consummate. one of the great clips isn't it when he stood stood up to ask uh, Nixon a question and they all applaud yeah and Nixon says to him are you running for something and he <laughs> pauses and he says no sir are you yes. I mean that boy. <laughs> That took some... Whoa. It did. Some cojones. Yeah, it sure did. It sure did. Uh, so I was, you know, uh, I again, over the moon to meet a guy like that. Absolutely. So he says you have to go to a small market. So I, I go on this trip, and one of my best friends, uh, who I crashed on his couch about a month later, calls, and he says, hey, my girlfriend is running this station 
in Fredericksburg, Virginia, um, send her a tape. And I'm like, okay. So I do. And this was a station run by a cable outlet, similar to locally now Spectrum. Okay. Uh, or would have been YNN or, or, or whatever, you know, whatever they call it this week. Right. Yeah. Where we, the the cable, if you had the cable company, uh, and you you, it was really a public access station, okay, more or less. But they produced a half hour newscast. Sure. And it had a, a, a news director, a reporter, a sportscaster, and then the anchor also did the weather. Okay. It aired also. You taped the news around five o'clock, but it didn't air till seven thirty, so it wouldn't compete with. The uh, local stations. Sure. It makes sense. And yeah. Fredericksburg is about a half hour. It's about 45 minutes south of D.C. and about an hour north of Richmond. So it really wasn't a market. Mm-hmm. And and I knew that. But I thought, well, nothing else is coming out for me. So yeah. I got to try something. You got to get the experience. Right. Yeah. And I thought, well, if it doesn't work. And actually, when I left CNBC, uh, another name that I will name drop, because I'm picking them all off the floor here, <laughs> uh, Andy Friendly. Son of Fred Friendly. Fred Friendly. Okay, yes. I know that name. Yeah, and Andy was in charge of primetime. I'll be darned. Uh, and uh, he said to me, "If if it doesn't work out and you ever want to come back, we'd love to have you back." Nice. And I thought, okay, great. It turns out he went out. And he he wound up producing for Tom Snyder when Tom went to uh, follow Letterman. Okay. Um, and then did some other things, but still another name that I was happy to have in my back pocket if sure, I ever needed. It. Sure. So I go there, and within six, seven months, the woman who hired me, my buddy's girlfriend, left. Uh, they broke up, whatever. I become the news director. <laughs> and I don't know the first thing about it. Yeah, right. <laughs> but so I'm, I'm working six days a week um, for almost no money, living in low-income housing, just trying to put a tape together, really. Yeah. And I wound up there for about two years. That led me to, I started, kept sending out tapes. Uh, but I had a great time. You learn everything. I mean, you just well, learn everything. That's the fun part about a small market is you get usually to do a little bit of everything. Sure. You know, oh, yeah. uh, whether it be in front of the camera or behind the camera. And yeah. that can pay off in spades later on. Yeah. We yeah. Uh, we created, I created the Week in Review because I always wondered, like, you we're putting together these stories. You wonder if anybody is watching them. Yeah. So at the end of the week, I had five or six decent stories, and we put them together on a Friday Week in Review show. So the, nice. the Friday newscast would air at 7.30, the Week in Review would air at 8, and we would tape that early enough on a Friday because we packed up every camera, every wire, every uh, uh, microphone we could get our hands on, a tape deck that wasn't nailed down, put it in the truck, and we go do the high school football game of the week. Oh, jeez. Or basketball game of the week. Yeah. <laughs> and I wound up being, you know, chief cook and bottle washer to help out um, just to run the cables. And then I was doing the sideline reporting. And then during basketball, I was the color commentator. So all these things <laughs> that I was, again, just trying to build – some yeah, kind of resume. Resume, sure. Yeah. yeah. So, but I'd work six, at least six days a week. Uh, the news wouldn't air on the weekends. Mm-hmm. But if you didn't go shoot those festivals and you didn't shoot the, uh, I don't know, if there was some kind of crime, if you didn't have that, you had no content Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. And then things kind of fell, fell into place there. Yeah. So I left uh, Fredericksburg and uh, there was a job open uh, in Kingston, here, Kingston, New York. Really? R- RNN. Okay. Regional yeah. News Network. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So I drove up and it was about 75 miles north of Wyckoff. Uh huh. So I said to mom and dad, uh, I may be moving back in with you. I don't know. <laughs> and they were fine with it. Uh, and I got hired. So I go to, uh, I'd spent some of the time in Kingston. They had a bureau in Piscataway, New Jersey, outside of or nice. near Rutgers. Yeah. So that's about 55 miles south of where I grew up. Mm-hmm. So one week, if they needed me to go to Kingston, I went up there and crashed on a couch. <laughs> and uh, if I needed to be in Piscataway, I would just farm out from that day. I would use my own car. They gave you camera and so on, but you're a one-man band. Yeah. You shot everything yourself. Yeah. But they were trying to be the, a, a local CNN, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. obviously now, RNN. And, and this is cable? This is cable. Okay. Right. Yeah, this is yeah. cable. And because I actually applied. 
when uh, they were putting a, an, a broadcast station on in Kingston. Okay. I actually applied, and it must have been the early 90s. I don't I don't. So I'm, that I was remember. WTZA, right? It, it may have been. I, I yeah. forget. Uh, the only detail I remember, well, besides not getting the gig, is that I actually took the only videotape I had of an interview half hour I did with, believe it or not, Mitch Miller. Hey. On the local PBS TV station, still have w- my mom's WMHT. WMHT. Yeah. Do you really? Oh yeah. Well, I work. I volunteered at WMHT, and every once in a while, they would hire me to sub for somebody that was doing the. It was Nancy Norman was her name. Mm-hmm. Five thirty to six, she did a phone interview or a phone talk show. Oh, wow. Where people could phone in and ask the you know sure. people that were there you know questions, yeah. which hardly ever happened. You used to have to fill the half hour yourself. Okay, right. right. I got Who's to do. Who's calling? Please, yeah. somebody call. I, I got to do like ninety seconds of news at the beginning, and then they'd break for a pre-recorded weather, and then I'd come in and do live for about twenty-five minutes interviewing. So it's the only tape I had, and I decided, well, they'll get an idea of my presence anyway because yeah, yeah. it was a news position. And so I drove down to Kingston, and uh, I didn't even get an interview. I just you know, I dropped the tape off and said I'm interested, and I must have heard back. Obviously, I didn't. I didn't get it, or maybe I never did hear back, and I wasn't surprised. <laughs> but uh, but King yeah, I got a lot of those. Only time I've ever been in Kingston was oh, to wow. apply for a news job on TV, which I, you know, probably would have failed at anyway. But well, there, I gave it a shot. There was a station. It was called WTZA. <laughs> okay, and, and they, the call letters referenced Tappan Z to Albany. Oh, they're oh interesting. Okay, so yeah. but then somebody bought it, and actually it was. At the time, it was owned, co-owned by Ernie Anastas. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Who's yeah. involved in, uh, uh, you know, the t- t- radio stations up here? Right. And yeah. used to yeah. be uh, and was in New York City, main anchor in New York City for a long, yep. long time, yep. and of course was the father-in-law of uh, our friend Greg Floyd. There you go. Okay. Um, and I believe Tracy Egan had a connection to Ernie as well. Well, yeah, because Tracy worked at WABC. Exactly. And Ernie yeah. was the main anchor there, there for a you long go. time. That's yeah. what it was. And okay. then he went and worked, uh, He, I think he worked at Channel 9 and Channel 5. And Sure. I met him one time in Philadelphia. I was working at RNN, and we covered the Volunteerism Summit. Okay. And I had never met Ernie, and I only watched him on television, and except now that I had this sort of pseudo connection, because he... I think he was bought out by somebody else for at RNN. But I got to cover the, the Volunteerism Summit in 96, run by Colin Powell. Wow. Uh, where every president, every living president was there. It was mostly, well, they were all there. And, and Jimmy Carter was certainly in his heyday sure. of, um, you know, revitalizing homes and right, having right. that humanity Habitat. and all that. Yep. Uh, and I went and covered this for two or three days. They they sent us there. And, uh, I actually, one morning near the steps of the famous Rocky steps of the, uh, museum of art. Yeah. Art museum in Philadelphia. Here comes Colin Powell. And I got a one-on-one with him for about three minutes. And it was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and RNN was still mad because it was always on a two shot. They just wanted the mic flag and Colin Powell. Oh, and they yeah. got me in there too. Yeah, well. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, and the other, I should, I can't stay all, all bad about RNN. They sent me to uh, Bosnia for two weeks. Wow. Also the summer of 96. I, yeah, I believe that. That's right. Yeah, because it would have been 94. If I do my, let me do my ears right here. <laughs> I, so I leave, uh, I was uh, CNBC from 92 to 94, and then 94 to. 96, I was at um, Fredericksburg. Right. And then 96 to the fall of 97, I was at RNN. Okay. So they sent us there to, we were doing something around July 4th to for the troops. Mm. We wanted to interview local troops from the Hudson Valley and do a show coordinating their families back in Kingston and the people that are in camp uh, Tuz- Tuzla Camp uh, Eagle in Bosnia mm. uh, and it was a whirlwind experience sure. for sure it was yeah. amazing so I got I went there for two weeks and they, they had a fast track I didn't have a passport they had to fast track my passport and then we're worried my parents are worried oh, do you have to have the right inoculations do you have to have all True. this and I'm yeah. like I, I don't know oh, boy and uh, we were in we walked through war torn Sarajevo and got mm. to meet all kinds of people and so again, I it was as a young kid in in his mid twenties. It was it was amazing, and uh, I'm like, I just interviewed and followed the Oliver North running for governor 
in Virginia, and now look at me. I'm over here in um, yeah. in Tuzla, wow. Bosnia, getting international experience. Yeah, getting stopped by the Serbs, and luckily, <laughs> and, you know, yeah. nothing ever bad happened. Yeah. Knock on wood. <laughs> I, I got home safely, and uh, matter of fact, went came home. Came home. My buddies picked me up. We go to the Yankee game that night. I fell asleep in upper deck somewhere, <laughs> and it was. The only thing that happened, I think they set a beer on my head or something, and I woke up when the fireworks went off. So, uh, but uh, yeah, whoever scheduled this trip uh, must have talked to the satellite people, and they didn't understand that it wasn't Tuzla, Bosnia. I think they thought they said Tulsa, Oklahoma, oh, no. or just the first word Tulsa versus yeah, Tuzla. Tuzla. Oh, so there was no satellite truck to be had. Oh God. So we had all these soldiers gathered in camp there, and we told them we're going to do this live satellite hookup, and now there's no satellite truck. And aye, we're going, aye, aye. what are we going to do? Yeah. And so we're trying to think on our feet, and I had this old phone card, or they, they'd given me a phone card, rather, Cable and Wireless, if you remember that old company. Okay. It didn't have international rates, so it didn't work. <laughs> but I happened to have in my pocket my... Uh, AT and T phone card, which was of course tied to my parents' account, <laughs> because I'm still living back at home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're trying to figure out how we're going to do this. They had all the parents back in the studio. They had, we had the, the the soldiers here, <sighs> and I said, "All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to hook up a camera. We're going to dial a phone line." And they're going to talk to them as if they're making a phone call. There you go. And then we're in the magic of TV a week later, we're going to put this all together. Wow. When we get back to Kingston. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know what kind of $600 plus phone bill it was, <laughs> but it took me another six months to <laughs> wrestle that money away from the owners at, R- at RNN. But I did get it that's, back. That's too much. And then uh, in that time, I with all that tape, I applied and... Um, Went for and got a job in Utica, New York. In okay. TV. Yeah. It was owned by a station. The Actually, the owners were out of Seattle, but they owned a bunch of stations. And one of the stations they owned was in, in Syracuse. And Syracuse bought this little station in Utica. Primarily as, I guess, as sort of a... Um, you had an office. The, the, like the office in, in Utica would have been where your one reporter would be. Okay. So, but... A, a, but a bureau or a something. A bureau. There's Is that the, the one word. you're That's the word I couldn't think of. Way to go. You're a real broadcaster, John. Good job. A bureau. Uh, but Syracuse had its own station. And what they would do is uh, they would feed some content to that station in uh, Utica, mm-hmm. WTR, which is actually on a UHF signal, not a VHF ah, signal. Ah, okay. The VHF signal was WKTV. They were the that superpower. That was Channel 2, wasn't yes, it? Channel yes, Channel 2. Yep, yep. Yeah, and they're the superpower. Yeah. And they're the NBC, right. and UTR was the ABC. But what they would do if, news-wise was Syracuse would gather uh, your money segment and your health segment and a couple other you know regular news segments you would see, but they would be fronted by the anchors in Syracuse okay. to take the burden off of the small market that was UTR yeah, so sure. we could concentrate on doing a few little local stories right. and interviewing, you know, mm. the mayor once a week, whatever it was. Anyway, they, they flew me out to Syracuse, drove me to Utica. Uh, I liked it well enough. I wound up renting a house for $500 a month. Not too bad. Uh, and I worked there for, as I like to say, two years, two months, two weeks, two hours, two days, too long, uh, till the end of 99. Uh, when they strung me along at the beginning of uh, uh, November and said, oh, yeah, we're going to um, extend your contract. And then by middle of November, I couldn't find anybody to talk to. And they decided uh, they weren't going to. Yeah. But they had hired me as the anchor and the managing editor. Wow. Uh, which was great. So I was getting sure. essentially two salaries of $20,000 each, Chris. Where you go. Yeah, yeah. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Well, it, you know, that, that's. I just difference. called you Chris, by the way. I'm that, sorry that's, about that. That's okay. That happens. That's, uh, yeah, everybody understands that. I've had whole interviews where people have called me Chris because that's no, no, no. the only name they know me by. No, no, no. Um, but, um, yeah, it that's. Warren, uh, I know that. Yeah, that's okay. Um, no, that's the. But when uh, I first met you, you that, I didn't know that. Well, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Nope. No, so anyway, so, uh, so then the UTR, uh, that dried up. And I wound up going to Lansing, Michigan, 
There was a station out there. I'll spare you the details. There was a woman involved. <laughs> um, she's my girlfriend at the time. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Long and the short of it. I go out to, uh, worked in Lansing, Michigan for about six months. And in that time, there was a job uh, offer opening, uh, rather opening. And I sent a tape uh, to WTEN here. Yeah. And they flew me out. I did a whirlwind day. I flew back to Detroit because um, that's where you flew in and out of. Sure. You know, Detroit to Albany. That was the flight. <laughs> and uh, within a few days, they had offered me a position. Nice. It was, it was going to be early mornings. The Channel 10 wanted to start an early morning show with a reporter. Imagine that 20 uh, plus years ago. Yeah. Which they didn't really have. But they liked what I, what I did, and they mm, turned it into, okay, we're going to have you be one of the main me- uh, evening reporters. Cool. So I worked, uh, I was Monday to Friday, three to midnight wow. um, to start. And yeah. then, you know, then you jump around there a little bit. I was there for... Now, who were the, who were the anchors, or the anchors there when you were at 10? Uh, Elisa Streeter and Terry McSweeney had just started. Okay. Uh, so he and I came in about the same time. He's from San Francisco. He's now back there and doing great things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Elisa was there. Terry, uh, Tracy Egan, of course, and John mm-hmm. McLaughlin did the five o'clock news there you go. together. Sure. Uh, and I learned so much from John and Tracy. I mean, I didn't want to insult Tracy, but I did grow up watching her on channels, <laughs> Channel 7 in New York. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I think she appreciated it because, you know, I cared. Some kids come in and, and you know, even I even look nowadays, you know, you, they just want to be on television. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of sizzle, no steak. Exactly. But I always wanted to be a journalist first, whether it be nice. doing sports Writing, whatever, uh, yeah. news. I knew I could get more. There were more jobs in news than there were in, in sports. But I always knew that that came first. And I think they understood that. I learned a lot from McLaughlin. We sat across from each other. And he knew that I was not some you know fly-by-night guy. Good. Um, yeah. uh, Elisa was terrific. Terry was terrific. I sat next to Dan Murphy, who did the sports. And John yeah. Spadafora was number two. And I was... Because I knew a little about sports, I became the de facto number three. Sure, sure. When, um, uh, when everybody else is home uh, enjoying right. the, uh, the holiday weekend. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, I wasn't married or had kids. so well, I could, uh, you fit right in there. That's they, they, right. They could use you, yeah. And I was two hours away from home. Um, so the few so I you I, hadn't you now you had well yeah you'd moved up here uh, yeah I moved obviously. here in July of 2000 okay there you go yeah that there was that was but, the time but what line, you're so. saying is if you know since it was two hours away you could still get there you know yeah. to, to be with the family but yeah. maybe not fact, on the holiday right and they wanted me to like I for for example uh, I they had me anchor Christmas morning which I didn't really want to do but sure. I'm low man on the totem pole so I did it so I. Uh, but they gave me Christmas Eve off and they gave me the 26th off. Nice. So I drove down on Christmas Eve, <laughs> still met, uh, saw some of my friends, sure. drove back, uh, got a few hours sleep, anchored the morning show, reported, got back in the car, drove back down to New Jersey uh, in the afternoon of the 25th, stayed the 26th, came back up on the 26th. And that's that's how you did it. This is the glamour yeah. of, of medium market right. uh, to small market radio and TV, folks. This oh, is it. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> and uh, I look back at it and sometimes and I go, should I have ever left CNBC? Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, so, so I was there at Channel 10 for seven and a half years. And then the owners, Young Broadcasting, mm-hmm. wanted to sell their stations. Yeah. And so they wanted to go lean and mean. Mm-hmm. So that within, um, it was the end of 07, uh, they brought in somebody to cut corners or cut, cut staff. Oh, sure, sure. And apparently, from what I understand, they couldn't get their ducks in a row by... They wanted to do it between Christmas and New Year's, which would have been a beautiful Christmas present. Well, it? and you know, um, the majority of of uh, broadcast interests, that's exactly when they do it. Yeah, you know, they right. they've got to look the at the bottom line for the coming year. Right. I, that, when I would, the only time I would, well, I, a couple times I was let go, uh, was always downsized. Yeah. And the first time it happened to me after seventeen years full time in radio, yeah. never a hint that I'd ever get fired from right. it. Right. Uh, and twelve years at that very station. It was on January uh, uh, 10th. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. January 10th. It just was going to make the books look so much better for the rest of the year. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So to go back to uh, when I was in Utica and when they did that, 
Because as I said, I was making a whopping forty thousand dollars. There you go, uh, Warren. You know, it's <laughs> oh, it making a lot of money. Yeah. Um, they so they led me along like I was going to sign a new contract. I had to go back to Syracuse that uh, sometime between Christmas and New Year's, and I fought to the news director who hired me. Now he wasn't privy to what I guess was going on here. Mm-hmm. And he took me to the GM, and I argued with him enough, and I made my case. I said, look, I stopped looking for other jobs because you guys were going to keep me going. There you go. Yeah. So they paid me for a whole other month. Wow. And that at least well, allowed me to pay my rent. At least you spoke up. So, yeah. So, yeah. So then I, yeah. And then I could go out to Michigan and wind up uh, out there to find another job. There you go. So I did that for a while. and But I've been lucky enough that uh, most of them have been my moves on my own. Yeah. But th- then this doesn't happen back in uh, WTEN. They can't get it done by the end of 07. But by the end of January of 08, you know, we saw it coming. I got a phone yeah. call earlier that day. And they said, uh, yeah, you know, this, today looks like it's today. And I go up and it was about three or four days before the Super Bowl, mm. which turned out to be, uh, 07 would have been the Giants Patriots first oh, wow. meeting, yeah. I believe. Yeah, Super Bowl 42. I wanted to take, I wanted to work the day shift that Sunday so I could at least watch the game because sure. it was still prime time. Yeah, I didn't say I wanted the day off, I just want, and of course, they come in and give you a severance. And I go, Well, at least I can watch the Super Bowl. Well, there now. you go, <laughs> and uh, and did. Um, and so I left there, and then within a couple of weeks, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I was married now. I just wasn't sure what was next. And maybe it was time. This was the time to get out of the business and do something else. And channel 13 called and said, uh, Hey, we're going to have somebody going on maternity leave. Uh, do you want to fill in for six months? There you go. And I said, great. Sure. Okay. Nice. Nice. So I did that. For six, yeah. yeah. So I was, uh, I, I did that. And then she comes back off maternity leave then my whole world took a different turn because I turned 40. <laughs> I met my cardiologist on my 40th birthday who told me, come back tomorrow. Uh, we have to run some tests. Uh-oh. And uh, I wind up from the day I met my cardiologist, which was on my birthday, October 20th, 2008. Eight, yeah. He says, uh, we need you in the hospital. I had quadruple bypass nine days whoa, later. Whoa, quadruple. Quadruple. Oof. Oof. The four cabbage. Mm. To, yeah. May, uh, yeah. Uh, but it turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Well, sure. Because I was married. Uh, so we had health insurance. I had just finished this run. It was, if it was, I mean, I'm glad it, they found it. Sure. Um, and I was able to recover and kind of get myself back together good once i did 13 actually said hey we want you back we 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 loved you in the newsroom in whatever way we can get you we don't have nice. a reporter position but would you come be an assignment editor or nice. would you come be a producer yeah and so the following uh, late summer is when i did i went back in the uh, august of 09 mm-hmm uh, now, was paul conti there at the time were you he working had just for paul? left he had just left, he just okay. left. Uh, matter of fact when i he was about to leave when I left 10 and I went down the hill to ask him, uh, people should know that the stations are literally one's up the hill, one's down the hill. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I went in just to get some advice from him. I didn't ask him for a job or anything. I just said, what do you think I should do? Nice. Because he'd been doing it for a long, long time. Oh, yeah. Uh, my wife, who is Kumi Tucker at Channel 13, uh, she'll probably be upset that I said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, she won't. Well, finally, you're mentioning somebody famous. Yeah. You know, God, you know, I mean, I haven't dropped a name in a long time. I, I, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but she said, um, uh, but I, I certainly wasn't going to go in there and horn in on her area. Sure. But, the, you know, they, it's funny, when I first moved here in 2000, you know, you say my name for fast, John Craig, uh, people immediately think you say John Gray. Oh yeah, because one of the first stories. Wait a uh, minute! Wait a minute! You're you're not John Gray. Oh, uh, oh! I should <laughs> crap. Leave. I should leave. I just spent I'm a sorry. whole hour here talking, and you're not John Gray. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Had to do that. I understand. <laughs> well, one of the first stories they sent me on Channel Ten sent me on. Matter of fact, I'll, I'll make it brief. 
is they sent me over to Delalo's Hardware to do, you know, one of those, um, uh, do you have enough shovels for, yeah, the, yeah, for, for the snow the yeah. storm that's coming? And yeah. I show up and I said, yeah, hi, I'm John Craig here. And they, she, she says, no, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? What do you mean? She says, you're not. I said, I, yeah. I said, I know I haven't been in the market very long, but I'm, she said, we thought you said John Gray. <laughs> so we're not going to talk so, to yeah. you. Yeah. I said, so you're not going to talk to me? And the owner's like, no, 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 I'll still talk to you. But um, so that's my real big connection with John Gray. <laughs> And then, ironically, he goes over to Channel 10, Isn't and that crazy? I'm at 13. And exactly. Crazy Years stuff. later. Yeah. But um, <laughs> so I, I go, yeah, so Conti was terrific. And uh, then he was going over to take that job at uh, St. Rose. Yeah. Uh, where she built up a ter- terrific school there. Oh, absolutely. Uh, for yeah. broadcasting. Yeah. Um, but he gave me some good advice about, hey, if you re-, he said, I never understood why we uh, people hire people that are supposed to ask people in authority questions, hard questions and question what's happening mm-hmm. and then expect them to just roll over when they're told the same thing in their own company. Yeah. So when I gave pushback back at channel 10 about why am I, why me? Yeah. You know, I produce more than, and you give push. He said, I have never understood that. Sure. And, um, hmm. uh, he, he was very good about just he laid it right out there and you know we've we've had a good cordial relationship ever since. Sure, but he was my uh, news director for a while at WGNA. Oh, okay. Before he went right. to TV. Yeah. Oh, all right, good. Yeah, yeah. and wow. I think I've mentioned it on this podcast before. A few weeks after he went over to uh, thirteen, uh, I'm talking to him and I said, "So what's it what's it like over there?" He says, "Well, it's nice to work at a place that has a budget." You know, he <laughs> yeah. said they they got more money to to buy a camera here than we'd have to equip a whole radio newsroom. You it's know? amazing. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. is. It's amazing. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so he he was very happy with the way uh, money wise yeah. it turned out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I and, and people should know I never. I'll run down. I'll tell you all my salaries if you want to hear. Them. I mean, <laughs> when I went to Fredericksburg, they paid me higher than they'd ever paid anybody before. Sixteen five. There you go for a year. Woo! And luckily, I had. Eight grand saved from, you know, my birthdays <laughs> in past what grandmothers had sent me. You're right. So I had some money to live in low income housing. But sixteen five. I go to R N N at twenty one five. Okay. And then when they created these extra jobs and so on, I went up to a whopping thirty, I believe. There you go. And then some from thirty I went to Utica, made the forty, which was the twenty and the twenties, how they justified it. Right. And my father is going, well, what are you doing? You're going to get a real job here. Uh, isn't it about time? I said, well, Dad, it's an affiliate now. Maybe I got yeah. something. Uh, <laughs> then I go to um, Michigan, and you're going to fall off your chair. When I reported, they hired me. It was a part-time job anyway, so I knew I only had like a six-month finite window that I either had to imp- uh, impress them or I was done. But when I reported, they paid me $7.40 an hour. And then I anchored the weekends, and they paid me nine dollars and twenty cents an hour. God, yeah, a TV station paying an hourly wage for mm-hmm. on-air talent and, yeah. and journalism. Yes, yeah, yeah. right, yeah. Oh. Uh, it, the only good thing about that was the one year that I was there, that the six months I was there, uh, Michigan State won the national championship in men's basketball, so I got to cover all the hoopla. Yeah. I didn't go to the game or any of that, but I got to cover all the hoopla in East Lansing. Mm-hmm. So, but so I make that. And every dollar I uh, I made either went into rent, my gas tank, or my mouth to, to keep me, keep <laughs> no, me nothing sustained. left over. Yeah. Nothing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, barely, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so then I left there, and then when Channel Ten hired me, my starting salary was th- back to thirty. Okay. Uh, and then I built myself up from there. Yeah. But then I got to the point that they, I was making, gosh, somewhere in the neighborhood of a little over 40. And that's when they decided, well, you know what? We can split this up and exactly. hire two kids out of college exactly. and for 22. Yeah. Well, uh, the stories you're telling and the numbers you're using, you just uh, divide that in about half for uh, the radio guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, well, they, I'm yeah. surprised. And I, actually, yeah. I thought, you know, some of the top talent were making more than oh, that. Oh, sure, sure. No, my, my 17 years in uh, full-time radio, I only got to about $17,000. Now, we're talking a little, you know, I'm a little older than you. Yeah. So we're talking uh, when I left uh, full-time radio was 86, okay? Yeah. But uh, within, uh, when I left the business and went into marketing and sales, I was making three times 
times that within a, a couple three yeah. years. Yeah, it was yeah. Just I've, crazy. I remember. You, yeah, yeah, I've yeah. heard you say that on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. So sure. I mean, it was it was just nuts. And I again have to thank my wife for saying, you know, maybe there's something besides radio right. you could do full right. time. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's good. No, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So to get back, so I go back to thirteen, and I did everything I could to just. Uh, I, I didn't necessarily need to be on the air anymore. Yeah. I, so are you are you writing, producing? Yeah, what are you doing? I'm yeah. running the assignment desk on the weekends primarily. Okay. Which, you know, you're you're setting up the calls and sure. you're setting up making sure the reporters can go out in the stories and some of these reporters you know that they can't unless you spoon feed them, they're not doing much. <laughs> uh but uh so so I would do that and then I would come in and write one or two days a week. It was only part time, it was thirty hours a, up to thirty hours a week. Hmm. Um, and I don't remember what they paid me then, honestly, but, um, but again, I wasn't going to upset the apple cart. My wife was there. She was fine. Everything was good. Yeah. I was just happy. To, and at the same time I said, I promised her I would keep looking for something out of the business, maybe something with the state. Yeah. Um, or in some other kind of private PR or something like that. Sure. Uh, I, I hopped on with a website, Capital Area Golf. Uh, I wound up being host of the bowling show, the, um, uh, Huck Fens Capital Region Bowling I did for eight years. Yeah, yeah. As is Joe Gallagher, is he here? Because he <laughs> he always wanted to be on that show. Yeah. So that I, I just did all those things, but I still stayed at thirteen and then they wanted me on the air. And so I would go back and I'd I'd report because I could do that. Sure. Um and we at the time I thought in that era, that framework, uh, and again I didn't grow up here, but for that time frame, 09 to the end of 10 and so on, I thought we had as good a rogues gallery of oh, reporters yeah. oh, absolutely. and anchors yeah. as we've ever had. I you think know, so, too. Cambrick had moved to evenings, and yep. uh, I think uh, I think Lydia was there for a while before she went over to 10, but Benita was there, and Mark Mulholland had been there, and he left to go do some things with, uh, with GE and so on, and then he came back, uh, and he was covering the, the North Country, uh, we had uh, we had top notch Lamb Bill Lambden was there mm-hmm. um, top notch reporters all the yeah. way around yeah and uh, it was it was a good time to be there I thought I thought I had made it to the number one station in the market you know the the top station uh, in the capital of New York mm-hmm. and I thought okay now I can go do if I stay here great if it's time to do something else that's okay too wow it was in New York City. Yeah. But it was probably the best I was going to do for now. Yeah. So. Yeah. Now, uh, GY jumps in here somewhere. What's Comes going in on the beginning there? of uh, the end of ni- the end of 2010. Okay. I get a phone call from Chuck Custer. We had yeah. run into each other. Um, I was out doing an MOS man on the street story about something and he couldn't be on cause he worked for the competition, <laughs> but he always said to me, I always liked watching you, uh, keep in touch. There may be some changes. And he obviously knew as the news director, that uh, Don Weeks was, I guess, getting set to retire. He was yeah. getting set to take over the morning show, and things were changing to WGY. And um, I pl- he, he asked me to, and I applied. And, and the way the formatting was work for then Clear Channel, um, they were going to downsize newsrooms around the region yep. and do this kind of hub versus spoke. Right. Uh, where you would do newscasts and send them out down the pike through the wonders of the computer mm-hmm. uh, and do morning news. And so, my, I, you know, I don't know how many, I didn't count up how many stations it was, but <laughs> it's probably about 12 other stations I was doing news for every morning. Yeah. Uh, so I was hired in January of 11 and, uh, and was there doing mostly out of market things, you know, Worcester, Mass., Manchester, New Hampshire. Even the Hudson Valley, Binghamton, um, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, yeah, those yeah. kinds of places. Right. Um, and you know, I, I didn't have I didn't have the Boston accent, so I don't think I got situated right very well, <laughs> very often. But uh, I did but that, the, that would seem to me to be the, the biggest challenge. If you're in these, if you're doing news from these other markets and you don't live there, I mean, think of how many times you've heard of mispronunciations here. Oh yeah, of people that are reporting either from out of market or they've come here from yeah. outside the market. Sure, and it takes them you know months to learn you know Valencia and uh, Glens oh, yeah. Falls with an S. You know, or Scatico. And, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. If you look at it like the that. first time, even Cooksacky or Cooksacky or whatever. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I I screwed it up as as in trying to be the local reporter and sure. oftentimes I would 
If I didn't know, I was never afraid to ask. Yeah. Uh, well, but so too often they didn't. That's just good journalism. That's yeah. just you know good training. Yeah. Uh, we would do. We did some newscasts for a station in North Jersey, and it was so funny. Somebody they didn't assign it to me, so oh, no. they gave it to to somebody else in the newsroom. Oh. And uh, which, which town did he really mess up? Uh, it was supposed to be North Halden, and he said Halidon. Oh. And I didn't know he had done it. And he comes in and then he, he was sitting at his desk and he was pre-reading his copy to go back in sometime mid-morning. And I heard him say Halidon. And I was like, what? What, what, is, <laughs> what, what? are you saying? I said, can you, what? What was that? And he said it again. And uh, oh. I said, yeah, um, it's uh, Halden. <laughs> it's Halden and North Halden. Yeah. And he said, oh. <laughs> I said, uh you yeah. can ask me. Yeah. Don't, you know, I'm exactly. not gonna. I'd rather have it right. Be right. Exactly. Then yeah. let's, because I'm sure I screwed up plenty of them. Oh, over time. Well, I I had never been east of the uh, uh, Hudson River, and I go off to Boston to go to school. Yeah. And I'm on the college radio station. Right. And I'm reading a, some headline, and it's uh, Worcester. <laughs> ah, <laughs> so yeah. I I, yep. I finished the newscast and. The door opens, you know, swings wide open, and the news director pops his head in. Of course, he's only a year older than me, you know. Right. And he goes, Worcester! And he closes the door and yeah. walks back out. You know? Yep. <laughs> but I didn't know, you know. What, yeah. I, I lucked out about that one because my brother went to Clark University in okay. Worcester. Yeah, yeah. And But, yeah, the first few times, I'm like, where am I? Where am I? I'm picking him up where? In Worcester? Where is this? What is this? Yeah. Uh, yeah, There's there were a few, for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. Uh, and there were more than a few. But uh, so so I got I, I did that and then that sort of spun into I would do some news updates for the river and uh, picks 106. Sure. Um, and then I was able to because of my my golf connections I was writing a column for the Troy Record bowling and golf. Um, so I got to do a little segment. I twisted Roger's arm on a 980 to put me on yeah. uh, once a week or so on and then I started taping some things there. And way back when, before a podcast are so prevalent now, I would tape these ten little, little ten minute vignettes, uh, segments that he would run in, in, in their nice. entirety. Yeah, nice. Cool. So uh, had all these little operations, uh, but again, knowing that you know that this may be the end of the road, you never know, and we'll see where it takes us. Yeah. At the end of we're somewhere in the spring of sixteen, TV came calling again. And I left. I left. Uh, I heart clear channel, whatever it is. And, yeah. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, I had, that was the other thing. I, I, I had just done, I think that's what also helped get this radio job is I knew that, um, Don Weeks was retiring. Yeah. I think at the end of 10. Yeah. I pitched hard to do a story at channel 13 about him. I said, he's, he's an iconic figure in this area. Yep. I, so I want to brighten his story for the Troy record. And I did about a two and a half minute piece uh, for Channel 13, that people were like, all right, well, well, I guess we'll air it in the five. And I said, you don't understand. Yeah. I said, first Who's of all. This man's yeah. icon. I said, but I remember, gro- I said, I and, and the way I pitched it was, when I was a kid, I always wanted to know what these people on the radio looked like. Because you never knew what they looked like. Yeah, yeah. And then one week on Live at Five, at Channel 4 in New York, they did Radio Week. And they had your top people come in and you wanted to tune in and see them because you never saw them. Right. This is, that's right. the way it was in the yeah. late seventies, early eighties. Yeah. And there was Imus and there was Scott Muni from WNEW sure. uh, telling their stories. And uh, I said, I don't know how many people know who, A, what he looks like, but B, the stories he's told, he's been, he wakes you up every morning. He, yeah. he gets you to, he reads the school closings, he, all these things. And they said, all right, do the story. Uh, and then we'll put it somewhere in the 5.30. Today is the 30th anniversary of a mainstay in the morning. Don Weeks on WGY Radio. And this Friday, Don will retire after a long, distinguished career in broadcasting. John Craig spent some time with him as he prepares to sign off for the last time. All right, 8.49 in the morning right now. Here's Jessica Lamp, WGY, all-day traffic. Hey, Jess. He's been the Capital Region's wake-up call. 
Don Weeks and the WGY Morning News got your day started for 30 years. From interviews to breaking news to corny bits, he's always blended his personality into the events of the time. Catch him while you can, because this Friday he'll be gone. That's right. Oh, hey, look, the poet and didn't know it. How about that? A very pleasant good evening to all of you. One of his first jobs was a weatherman here on Channel 13. He even did bits then, including a tally called God versus the National Weather Service. The government sent him a cease and desist letter. I showed the audience the National Weather Service's weather balloon uh, that they used to forecast the weekend forecast. And it was this huge Mickey Mouse balloon. This huge had a Mickey Mouse that they had in the attic uh, over at Channel 13 for some reason. We got more trouble. Born in Albany and raised in Schenectady, Weeks turned down other markets, working in advertising for other stations, and at his wife Sue's urging, took the seat as WGY's morning man on December 1st, 1980. In 2005, he won the prestigious Radio Marconi Award, and last year was inducted into the New York State Broadcasters Hall of Fame. He still has bits on cassette he's been sharing with listeners, and received lots of fan mail as he retires. Favorite interview? I think, actually... I don't know. I can't tell you. It's almost, and, and it's, it's the oldest cliche. It's like, who's your favorite kid? Don is actually retiring a few weeks earlier than expected at the request of his doctor. He has Wegner's granulomatosis, a rare blood disorder, but he says he's already improving. He's looking forward to sleeping in and listening to his successors, longtime sidekick Chuck Custer and former News Channel 13 anchor and reporter Kelly Lynch. To have had the privilege of, you know, going into so many people's homes every morning and being welcomed so warmly I mean it's, it's people consider you a friend and to have come from those streets to this and talk to some uh, talk to royalty talk to presidents uh, talk to some of the biggest the biggest stars of the uh, of the last 30 years I mean you talk about an impossible dream I mean God has been very good to that kid <laughs> John Craig, News Channel 13. Uh, everybody watched it in my newsroom, mm. and they all said we were wrong, and that was a great story. Nice. And, and, you know, it's never really the reporter. I mean, yes, you have to be able to put a sentence together, but if you don't have a good subject, you, you don't have anything. Yeah. And yeah. obviously Don was terrific. And, easy subject, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he was great. Such a great guy. Yeah. So um, and uh, right around then, now we we uh, I was obviously working weekends at yeah. uh, at uh, TRY at the time, and I would drop in on Gallagher, right? And uh, and so I got to know you there, yeah, because you're doing you know news for well, Joe on on Saturday because or that's what they Sunday said mornings, is they yeah. said you know. Um, yeah, you have to work Monday to Friday, but every third weekend yeah. you have to work both Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay, yeah. all right, whatever. Yeah, for the same money. Yeah, yeah. uh huh. Yeah. Well, we all got right. a, we got a chance to meet and then yes. and, uh, and 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 enjoyed our time together. Uh, how brief it was. Yes. But then um, uh, 2019 comes around and it's the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. Right. And all of a sudden, I get a call from you saying, <laughs> you know, you're over at 13 at the time, and right. you said. Uh, we're we're doing a story. You 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 know. You can I can I come talk to you about yeah. uh, about your memories of that night? Because I had just started in radio at the time. I was sixteen, right? That's uh, right. Years old, actually. Uh, uh, five days after the landing, I turned seventeen. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so we had a, f a fun uh, you know few minutes. Sat on you your beautiful veranda. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, you brought a, a an actual cameraman, which I, I thought was pretty cool. That's right. You know, and uh, we sat and talked for a little bit. Well, and I'm old enough to uh, I I like to tell people that i am old enough i did see the moon landing um <laughs> how, how old were you i at was the time? sitting on my mother's knee i was about <laughs> six seven months old at the time because I, I was born in october of 68 and wow the moon landing was you know the July following summer of 69, of 69 that's yeah. right but and um it's funny there's a um my mother bought that year every year we'd get a christmas ornament so that year there was a special ornament of an astronaut yeah. that she bought it wasn't, you know, these commemorative. It was just a yeah, cute sure. glass ornament right. that she hung on the tree every year, and sure enough, in my drunken stupor, when oh, I no. had all my buddies oh, no. over in college, and I happened to stand under the mistletoe, my buddy comes over to give me a big kiss, and we fell into the tree. Oh no! And the only thing that survived, well, and we fell on that ornament, who, oh. but the head survived, the helmet. <laughs> survived 
<laughs> and to this day, I have it. Oh, no. And I still hang it. My mother used to hang it back on the tree until she passed away. And then I, it was bequeathed to me. And it still hangs on my tree every year. Oh, so that wow. helmet is there. And it reminds me every year that, yes, I... I saw the moon landing. Wow. Um, that's, <laughs> that's a whole funny. other story you can edit out later. But uh, <laughs> but no, uh, yeah, no, it was great. It was so so great that you were able to share those memories. Because well, thanks. I, it was another example, by the way, of they television hadn't planned ahead. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, what are you it's doing? The 50th anniversary. I said, Come right, on. let's do the And then that... I, I interview you, yeah. and I go up to RPI and find out that one of the top uh, teachers, uh, deans yep. up there, had, had worked on it. Yeah, uh, and you just go start going down these rabbit holes. Yeah, that. Um, but if you don't do it, and if you don't do the legwork, nobody else is going to do it for exactly. you. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so you're you're finally smartening up and deciding that maybe uh, broadcasting isn't uh, the end all and be all, which I learned a lot earlier than you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. After about thirty years, I figured it out. <laughs> yeah. So, when did it all uh, culminate in you uh, moving moving on to uh, you know uh, state pastures? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I get a phone call from. Uh, a friend of mine who knew somebody that was at one of the state agencies saying, hey, they were looking for somebody in public information. Uh, and if you're interested, send send your resume. And this is great because I didn't have to send him a tape. Yeah. Or I didn't have to send him an audio tape. Or <laughs> right. I didn't have to send him a DVD. Right. I could just send him a, my, my, my resume. resume yeah. My two-page resume. So I do. And this was the um, June of 19. Okay. And the state doesn't move very fast. Uh, <laughs> so it, it kind of drags along. And by the end of the summer, late summer, it looked like I was going to get hired for the, by the state of New York in one of the public information for uh, children and family services. So uh, around Labor Day, but again, I forgot how things, I, I didn't know how things worked, worked in the state. In the state did yeah. not. Uh, Labor Day becomes Columbus Day. Columbus Day becomes uh, Halloween. And finally, around there, I get a phone call saying, okay, you're hired. It finally went through. When can you can you start? Uh, and I said, well, i got to give at least two weeks' notice. Sure. I'm still working at 13, even yeah. though I didn't have a contract. Yeah. Uh, and they said, okay, well, we hire people on a Thursday. So how about November 20." Third, fourth, whatever. I said, isn't that Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving day? week or day? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they said, yeah, it is. Um, I said, but because nobody works on that day, uh, and I can work discretion. We just really want to get you in here, but I can be discretionary on this. Um, we'll say that your starting day, and uh, it'll really be. You can come the next day, but there won't be anybody here, so I'll worry about that there. <laughs> and so you can start on the following Monday. Yeah, and I said okay, and that Sunday night it was a huge snowstorm, and they closed all this non-essential <laughs> state, so I didn't start work till a Tuesday. Oh, okay, but <laughs> the the so uh, and I hope they don't dock my pay. But my last day on the air was Thanksgiving morning of nineteen, mm -hmm. and which was technically my first day at the state. <laughs> Um, I do the, I do the Equinox thing down at the Capitol. The line is long, yet no one seems to mind. The camaraderie and the hope. Hey, you got to be festive if you're going to celebrate. Last year we went to a place and this lady gave us all scarves because she is so thankful that we brought her. They told me how much fun it was to wake up at 2.30 in the morning and drive for a half hour and hand out food and wait in line. So it's fun. It's an event. We camp out and yeah, it's fun giving back. He drove from Connecticut to join his cousin Jonathan Deschalis, a high school junior, to deliver Equinox meals on Thanksgiving. Every year it's always on. Um, they always show really good reaction. They're always really happy when we bring them the food. It was kind of a dedication tribute to my dad and what my parents uh, had instilled in us of giving back to the community. A few spots over, a teenager from Syracuse came to visit her aunt in Furibush for the holiday. I love that she was inspired by hearing the stories of the people that we delivered the food to. And, and this, waiting. And this family from Gilderland is one with Uno. Nine-year-old Nico even made his own energy drink. Is there a secret ingredient in that energy drink? Sugar. Uh, and that's the end of it. I sign off, and I started the following week at the state. I worked... Uh, at the one uh, that agency for 
about two, two and a half years, and now I work for New York State Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, yeah. and this is our centennial celebration this year. Oh, wow. Yeah, the um, uh, the the uh, governor at the time, back in uh, 1924, created a agency that oversaw all this. Some of the agencies, some of the parks are older, like Niagara Falls, sure. much older, but this is the year, uh, 24 now, 2024, uh, that uh, 100 years ago is when they started Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. And I'm working for public affairs there, so it's great. That's very good. Yeah. Very good. We can't let this end without you at least mentioning your daughter, just in case someday she listens to this and wants to know, Mommy, what did Daddy do? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my daughter my daughter is Julia, and uh, she is terrific. She's um, she, we, have, we have just the one. Yeah. Um, but she's 12. I love her so much and I'm coaching her basketball team. Cool. And, um, but she gets all her brains from her mother who went to Princeton, <laughs> not from her father who it was a vagabond at all these stations for all this time. But, uh, no, and she she's smart. Uh, I see your piano for dummies book back there behind uh, yeah. you. I may need that because we we do have a keyboard, but she can sit down and play it like nobody's business. <laughs> wow, uh, she's she's into art and um, she loves to public speak. Go figure. Uh, where did they get? Where did uh, she yeah, get that? The, she's she no uh, playing clarinet now. Uh, had gone to her. private school for a long time and is now in, in the public school system. Makes great friends. She's nice. So. Yeah. I could go on and on and brag about her, but yeah. uh, I hope she gets past uh, chapter four, which is the it's, twice it has stopped me. I've ne- I never <laughs> my my wife got me this great keyboard years ago and bought that book with it. Yeah, and you know twice I tried to get past chapter four where you have to start learning how to read music. No, you see that's that deals with if you ask anybody that's in music, it deals with math sort of mm-hmm. things. And hey, I never got through math class without help. You know? No, so, she yeah. she's uh, she um, her grandparents, my in laws, got her a keyboard a few well several years ago now, and she took to it, uh, and um, I think that that's true. Made wonders. She yeah. she can still sit down and do it and play some. Tunes that's wow. it's transitioned to her now doing the clarinet, um, and uh, so many other things. And that's so she's, nice. Yeah, we, she's we, making well, bracelets. I mean, she's probably going to sell you a bracelet. Uh, the, uh, we have a niece that we gave the keyboard to. Okay, and I'm not going to take all the credit, but she's studying uh, music composition and education at Ithaca State now. Oh so. wow! Well, so I mean, come you. on. It, it's obviously it's, it's because, because I of gave her that's my right. keyboard. Absolutely, yeah. congratulations. <laughs> good, good for her. Good uh, for her. John, this has been terrific. Thank you so much. Thank for, you uh, for sitting and, and doing this. And I know you're just over, uh, you know, some uh, flu-like symptoms yeah, from last week. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you, you get the uh, flu shot, and then they <laughs> get the wrong strain. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've all, we've all, and we all battled, of course, all these uh, health issues we've had the last few oh, years, God, one yeah. form or another. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, boy, it knocked me out last week for sure. But the great thing is I worked for a place that they didn't say, you still have to come. Uh, honestly, when I did morning news, then that's the last uh, few things I did. You could be on death's door. Yeah. But who was, who was going to come in and fill? Yeah, you if had you to didn't do know, it. If you didn't feel good at 7.30 or 8 o'clock p.m., sure. you're not going to get somebody at 2.30 or 3 that's in the morning. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. But that was, yeah. uh, and that's the one thing. Uh, the One of the other reasons I left and even entertained it was the last three years, I, I loved it. Doing the morning show was fine. You never knew where you were going to be, all that. But getting up at two thirty in the morning. Oh God, yeah. And I did it yeah. for radio. Getting up and being in there by three thirty in the morning. Sure, sure. It just yeah. wears on you to a it, point it that can. you go, yeah. "That's enough." Yeah. And it's time to do something else. And yeah. uh, the people that complain about nine to five have never worked the uh, two thirty to uh, that, noon. That shift. is for sure. Yeah. And, yeah. and <laughs> when you say, uh, "I learn," I learn now at the state. You can say, "Hey, have a nice weekend." Because you can do that. Yeah. But when you're in a newsroom, I never said it because I knew somebody was not going to, because their weekend was not when their weekend was. Exactly. And exactly. Uh, I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. That's and true. if you complain too much about it, and eh, maybe the business isn't for you. Exactly. Exactly. So. Well, it sounds like you've had some fun along the way and, uh, you know, are where you're supposed to be right now. You get to spend some time with your daughter. and, and uh, Yeah. You know, and, oh, yeah. Yeah. Because my wife still works weekends. So yeah. uh, my daughter and I get to spend a lot of time together, nice. especially on the weekends and um, either playing with the dog or just going out and exploring <laughs> cool. uh, wherever we can go. 
Have you started recording, by the way? Uh, oh, uh, oh! Did I turn it on? <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to turn it off. No, but we've we've had a lot of fun so far. It's just the three of us and our little nuclear family. That's true. Um, and uh, but we're able to um, have some vacations now. Again, yes. things you, you didn't yeah. have when you know you're working these uh, crazy yeah, that's businesses. That's true too. That's true so. too. Well, best of luck going forward, and uh, you know, just uh, a, a joy sitting here talking with you. Thanks for sharing. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Warren. I really appreciate it, and. Uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to, to get to know you. And yes, anytime you came in on those weekends, um, it was always great to be able to play off of you, but you had great stories. I learned a lot just about the business itself. Um, and you had that extra, you know, the pizzazz and you had oh, that, thank you. you had that, uh, you had those ideas and advice that, you know, I could look at and go, Hey, maybe I can get back into this if I really want to. But at the same time, I can make a good career out of something else, too. Yeah, yeah. Good. Nice talking to you. Thank you so much. Take care, John. Radio Split Ranch. You know, I knew I liked this guy from the moment we met. But to learn he rubbed shoulders and worked with some of my all-time favorite communicators, just icing on the cake. Thanks for sharing, John. After our conversation, John was nice enough to tally up the call letters, both radio and TV, that he's either volunteered or worked at in his colorful career. They total 10, including his 10-watt high school radio station. He helps bring our running total of call letter mentions on this podcast to 2 298 over 29 interviews. And we're going to end this month's edition appropriately with an air check from one of John's stops. We alluded to the fun he and I had when we worked together at the iHeart Cluster in Albany and would spend a few minutes live in the studio with longtime WGY personality and radio legend Joe Gallagher. Here are the three of us from April 25th, 2015, as usual, talking about a lot of nothing, but having a ball doing it. Enjoy, and please join us again next week at the Radio Split Ranch. Invite a friend along. Until then, don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. Corporation will match it with another 55 grand. I'm Michael Barr, Bloomberg Radio. Whereas he arrives each weekend morning prior to 6 a.m. to prepare his show. Whereas he gets the pre-show jitters, and he's known as Derek Jitters. Whereas he proclaims to have his show prepped. Whereas, when asked where is his show prep, he replies, Whereas, who is you to whereas me? Whereas, it is now resolved that this is Joe Gallagher. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I love those... What, what what is that show prep of which you speak? What what is that? That's uh, what we uh, wear at. Uh, whereas <clears throat> he prepares his show prep in where at where in uh, isn't that redundant? Re- preparing your show prep. Wait, huh? I preparing pre- your show prep. Oh, preparing uh, your show preparation. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, all right. Whereas where did you come from? How about <laughs> where did you come from? Where Schenectady? You ever sat through a resolution? We were talking about it last Sunday. You ever sat through a resolution? You oh, know, when they're like, whereas, whereas, yeah, whereas. yeah, I have. Yeah, Come and on. you're saying get to the point. Would you? Jump, kick that stuff out of here. <laughs> Do some work in the assembly or legislature. Get some work done. Now you Stop wouldn't be way. saying that if they declared a Joe Gallagher I, I day. I wouldn't want to whereas. But Don't that's give... how they do it. Huh? Yeah, that's how they do it. If you want a Joe Gallagher day, you're going to have to, you know, go through the whereases. I don't want to whereas. I don't don't give me no whereas. I want to hear about no whereas. Okay, I just want to get to the dessert, <laughs> and that's usually what it does. It's between the dinner and the dessert. <laughs> exactly. Well, I want to hear about no whereas. Okay. <laughs> So anyway, oh by the way, uh, you uh, you work at our sister. You were Chris Warren. At last I checked. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you. Uh, anyway, Chris, uh, welcome aboard. Well, thank you. Beautiful day today. You didn't recognize him. I don't my glasses. <laughs> I, I didn't even see you in there. Because, oh, yeah, cause, right, because you're wearing my. Cause he's wearing I, t- your I said earlier we could switch glasses if you really want to check them out. Here, I'll come over no, right now. No, no, John, that is bad. I'm not going to do that. I learned as a little boy. What? Don't be putting on people's glasses. No, no, what, don't make me do that. Because no, on, get away from me. Get a little wreck. No, I don't want to put those on. No, it's bad for your eyes. My mommy. 
And Where are you, Joe? Where yeah, Al, don't Where hit me on the head. He's Where hitting me go? on the head now. Put the glasses back on, He hit me on the head. Luckily, You wouldn't try other people's glasses luckily, on? Come here. Luckily, your your have, mother told you not to try other people's glasses other, on? It was, yeah, don't be putting other people's glasses on because if they're – if their uh, prescription is stronger than yours, it could impact you. That's what I heard. Not for a second or Jeez. two. Jeez. Not when you just wear them oh, for a Oh, so few now moments. you're telling me my mom was wrong. Well, yes. You yes, you just like you can go swimming my... after you eat and, uh, <laughs> you know, too much TV's not bad. Well, maybe that one's Well, not, maybe that yeah, one's yeah, not, yeah, not so good. Maybe been right, yeah. Well, yeah. maybe it wasn't my mom who told me. It was somebody, and I... Radio bit. He can't even go along a couple of seconds. might have been our local city council member. I think you'd see as well out of these as I see without them. Which is not very good. You, I think that's, I would gather that twenty four thousand vision. That's what I have. <laughs> twenty four thousand. Yeah, something now, like that. Chris, I think they just stop measuring. <laughs> Chris, uh, he had glasses, but he got rid of his. Now he doesn't wear them anymore either. That's right. You want to borrow mine? No, that's fine. I just, <laughs> I just need the five dollar cheaters from the uh, grocery. You know, oh, the, good for the, you. The store. Did now. you get LASIK? I'm fine. Uh, no, I had uh, uh, cataract surgery, and oh. they put uh, lenses in when they took the cataracts there you out. Go. And now I don't need glasses. What do you for mean lens distance? Uh, well, you... they put magnified blend. They put my prescription in. This has been ophthalmology corner. So they're there forever. Uh, well, until they have to play with the cataracts again, which can happen, I guess, more than once in your life, depending on how long you live. Oh. Yeah. John, you could avoid looking like you do now if you... Oh, but this. If All you, you need to do is get cataracts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My brother had LASIK surgery. Yeah. So... Yeah, I've not had it yet. No. No. Well, I'm, I got the... Never mind. No, I just... It's I not asked worth it. John earlier today if his wife was aware that he had <laughs> glasses because he wore contacts. Because <laughs> he hardly ever wore glasses. Yeah, you, you, you obviously, did you take you take your lenses out at night and every put night. the glasses on? Yeah, yes. yeah I did well, that That's nobody's for many business years, yeah. but his and his wife's. He takes his lenses in or out. <laughs> that's rude, Chris. Uh, sorry, John. I so she, if she sees you after dark, she knows that you also yes, wear glasses. that's right. Yeah. If she, she sees you in the... A Santa and luckily, she woke me up this morning because it would have been I would have been scrambling to get in here. Wait a minute. Your wife woke you up this morning? Well, she came in. It was 3.40 this morning, and she said... You know, you have to. And I said, "Yeah, I got the alarm set for four. So, oh, oh. don't you hate it when that you happens. don't get an elbow? Twenty I get like minutes you missed out. I get you, you never get those twenty minutes back. No, you don't. <laughs> I laid there and just bothered to get up. And I feel bad for Chuck and Kelly because I wake up every morning. Our alarm goes off first thing, and uh, I have to say things to them as I hit the snooze. Oh, <laughs> and I, I want to apologize both to Chuck and Kelly right now for that. I mean, there's nothing against you personally. It's right. just the idea that. Um, and then I do it the second time. We get the shoes twice. <laughs> I wonder you, you wonder how many people are doing that, though, yeah, really. Yeah. They must no, be those getting, poor guys. They must get know, tired of that, yeah. I uh, Today, uh, we were talking about Chuck and Kelly, and the fact is that uh, our weekend meteorologist, Bill Dagger, provides us good weather. Mm-hmm. And I said yesterday we had terrible weather. How could Chuck, that Chuck and Kelly should have been embarrassed that we had that kind of weather yesterday? Because their job is to draw the good weather out of the meteorologist like we do on the weekend. Okay. And we could have bad weather right now, but you know what I do? I draw the good weather out of Bill Dagger. Wow. Nice. But Chuck and Kelly, for some reason, uh, and they should be embarrassed mm. over what happened yesterday. And they owe an apology to the capital region i couldn't see the good weather i didn't have my glasses yeah. <laughs> so chris what's new with you I, I i i don't know 30 bags of lawn um uh, rakings oh, last yeah. weekend 30 yeah. bags i counted them that's 30 you know, bags that's how anal i am okay. uh, yeah that was a bags. long weekend last weekend yeah. but i don't have to i'm done now till the fall so i mean that's cool well let's switch yeah. to john john have you done any bags of lawn and <laughs> i only have I bags mean, under my I, eyes I, I, <laughs> thank you do you do any raking at your house? No, I rent. Oh, nice. Yeah, you know, you know it's know, almost worth. <laughs> well, everybody <laughs> wants to buy them. I, I still, I still get out there and rake a little bit. And actually, my daughter now, we we did it in the winter time. We had we shoveled, so we got our own little shovel. <laughs> yeah. So I'll have cool. to get her own little rake, and there maybe we'll go. get out there and clean up a little bit. My, but uh, luckily, my landlord comes by with he and a couple of guys uh, once a spring and. Does some spring cleaning. Yeah. My, so my granddaughter got out there with a little rake. There was a little mini rake we got her last that's year. That's fun. And, yeah, it lasted yeah. about five minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I know, exactly. Right. All yeah, right, well, Daddy, my, I'm done with this. Yeah, my right. younger son Morty, he had a little lawnmower. He used to go around, follow me around with a lawnmower. Yeah, know? yeah. And, uh, and now that he's older, I want him to get to use the lawnmower at all. I yeah. can't get him even near the lawnmower. <laughs> yeah, my my sons uh, that that phase lasted about you know one summer. Right, you know, where each of them got to the age where they could do it, and I said, you know, and I'll, I'll pay you, and and it lasted about a summer. Then they went off and got regular summer jobs the next year, and sure, I was well, back at it again. Paid in, better in the days. Yeah. <laughs> True. Parents, they made us. We were, you know, we, I think our kids have it easier today because um, 
you know, but back then my my dad wanted me to mow the lawn. I mowed the lawn. No, mm. it's you know, I mean, it's we're easier. You don't want to mow? Okay, you don't have to mow the lawn. Oh yeah, that's the way you brought your kids up. Huh? Well, yeah, they they got they're bigger than I am now. Well, that's true. They do get to that point. Yeah, they uh, do. Yeah. But um, yeah. now Jamie Roberts uh, works at your what station? Yes, are you old, at oldies ninety eight three mornings. Yeah, she's on every morning Monday through Friday and Saturday afternoons. Uh, you're just bad. You're bad at John. Craig. I know. I, didn't I, ask I heard. For a, I heard John give the time and date I, of his. I asked for a brief <laughs> summary. I you mean uh, Huck Finn's Capital Region oh. Bowling with only a couple weeks to go? 10 a.m. on my four <laughs> Albany Lord. tomorrow and Hell. next Sunday. Did you see Modern Family this week? No. It was. It took place in a bowling alley. It was a lot of fun. Oh, and it made me right. want to get back out there and bowl. See, I used there to you go. Leads, he wants to quit. You know, he yeah. shouldn't I, quit. I have. I retired from forever from bowling. Really? My mother-in-law beat me. Oh. Um, <laughs> At a game, and I said, that's it. And I wanted to let the bowling ball fly, the bowling shoes. My wife said, hang on to everything. Talk to John Craig. He can He'll, come. Talk, yeah, you you He'll right. talk you down. He'll talk you down. That's yeah. right. John is a bowling host, she said. He's a co-host of a bowling show. And uh, John can probably talk you back into it. Right probably now, could. I haven't bowled in four weeks. That's wow. unfortunate. That's, I think you can do it. Why? Bad. Because I haven't been in? You could have called me. You could have emailed me. I mentioned to you a couple weeks ago in the hallway. Do you remember that? Yes. You blew it off. Like no, I did not blow it off. Care. You said you said I'd wait for your therapy when you when you back in on the news <laughs> you because said, I think you were re- deliberately delaying bowling. You didn't really want to do it. I do like to bowl. Well, I did. I don't need more after my mother-in-law beat me. You need to practice. My mother-in-law that, got forty-four. Can be, Maybe yeah, you need my that glasses. Can be humiliating. Maybe yeah. you can see the pins better with my glasses. <laughs> oh, I bet you can see them. Yeah, I bet you can see the ones over at Spare Time Latham <laughs> right now. Yes, I can. <laughs> you can see. There's a misrack on Lane 26. <laughs> hey, remember those glasses they used to advertise where you could see through walls? Uh, yes, yes. Did right. they ever the work? X-ray you know? glasses? Uh, no, Joe. My I mom wouldn't buy me some. I, you know, they were. Uh, you could go look through uh, clothes too. Supposedly. Supposedly, yeah. That, yeah. That, that's how they advertised. That's right. In, in the back of the uh, did not get a pair. Magazines. Yeah. You, you <laughs> bought them. Chris? No, I did not. John, you bought them. No, I wanted them. Come but, on. But you know, I had to be. I was like, I was thirteen. Well, how do you know, Chris? They don't work. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he's got you there. Yeah. Well, I suppose since I've never tried them, I suppose they could work, Joe. And you would ask your mom to buy you a see through so you could see through clothes? No, I didn't tell her that part. <laughs> so I could help her. If I saw her in the kitchen, I could see through the wall. <laughs> didn't work out that way. Hello, Mary. How are you? <laughs> Well, John, you've got weird glasses on there. Oh, my eyes are not that good, Mary. <laughs> and then, uh, well, I, I, I wonder, I never, I personally used to see the ad in the magazines, but I never mm-hmm. sent away for them. Right. <laughs> Me too. What? Oh, no, never mind. Never mind. Uh, anyhow, so here we have a sunny day. We're going to enjoy being, uh, yeah. get, finally getting in. Uh, last week was very nice, too, though. Actually, it was. It was yeah, a beautiful yeah. weekend. We- well, you know what was uh, was really weird, though? And the forecast was dead on. Last uh, Saturday, they said it would be nice and warm and sunny, and somewhere early afternoon, the wind would pick up. Right. Well, of course, it picked up while we had a few piles of leaves oh, raked Chris. together. And I swear, that wind came through, and it was the first gust was like 50 miles an hour. And every Everything we had that we hadn't put in bags yet just went all back on the lawn. You probably said to those leaves what I say to Chuck and Kelly when I hit the snooze button. Yeah, it was along those lines. Yeah, you okay. actually you heard the whole neighborhood groaned. Everybody oh. that was out, you heard everybody. Yeah, I yell. know it's yeah. a, that's annoying. <laughs> that is very, uh, very, very bad. I wanted, it was crazy. I uh, you uh, I know I had something I wanted to. Um, well, it's probably time for me to go, Joe. Oh, uh, that might be. But I the thing I wanted to uh, and oh by the way the Yankees uh, broke the Mets eleven game win streak. Yeah, I saw night. that. Yeah, I, I in a way I, I'm a Yankees fan, but I, I was you, you I always to see root the Mets for the continue. underdog. Yeah, right. The Mets. I mean, they deserve some some good news. They're having a great start to their season. They're good and, this year. They're and, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, as are the the Red Sox. You know, they're right up there with everybody else. Yeah, and uh, I. I'd ask John if he saw the game, but I don't. He didn't have his contacts in. So. <laughs> um, all right. Well, anyway, Chris, you will be on tomorrow. Yeah, right at uh, a little after twelve noon when Casey Kasem's done with his countdown on Oldies ninety eight three. All right, and as I said, your cohort uh, Jamie and I will be at the uh, will be in Albany at the Children's Hospital this coming uh, Thursday and Friday morning, ten to noon. Chuck and Kelly five thirty to ten. It's all for the. Uh, the the kid children you know the kid cares radio thon we yeah. do every year yeah, it's really yeah. really Jamie nice. loves doing that it's it's a it's a great thing oh it is and uh, you know it's the benefit the Bernard and Millie Duker Children's Hospital at Albany Med and we hope that you'll be just as generous as you've always been uh, again Friday 
Uh, Thursday and Friday, Chuck and Kelly, 5.30 to 10, then Jamie and I from 10 to noon at the cafeteria. And our sister station, the River, also very involved in at this. At the cafeteria? Well. At the... Uh, We're, are we going to hear you on the air at all no, if you're doing we, it from no, the cafeteria, no, Joe? No, stop. No, I... Yeah, no, you'll, I'll be there. Don't <laughs> worry. And I won't be eating anything at all. Oh, okay. But it's always a great thing to do that. And we're, and it's being presented by Keeler Motor Car Company, Price Chopper, and Fryhoffers. Terrific. Well, Chris, I want it's good to see you again. Always well, fun to be here, Joe. I enjoy this. Yeah, and uh, nice to see you without glasses. You don't need them. That's true. Okay, and John Craig mentioned earlier that I have glasses, but we don't. Mm-hmm. There's fine. no need to mention that on the air. Yeah. That's it's nobody's business. Right. Okay. As long as I have Andrew show me the door, I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, he's over there to the left. A okay, bit, I think. All right, thank you, Chris. It's 850 WGY. Good morning. The dependable weather info.